Welcome, this is an integrated Math 1 practice test, the 2017-18 edition for 10 Ready. This is question number 28 back in 2017-18, or currently in, depending on when you're watching this. You ever have one of those classes that seems like it goes on forever? This problem seems like it goes on forever. This is an integrated question, which means there's lots of different components that are all related. The good thing is, don't give up if you can't figure out part A, B, or C, because they're not necessarily related. They're just based on the same topic. As part of a class project, Marcel surveyed 12 students at his high school, or his school, it may not be high school, I don't know, to estimate the exercise and television viewing habits. So he made a scatter plot here. He is comparing time spent watching television versus time spent exercising. And he models the data, so this is his equation that he's created. I'm at the age when I hear the, word, the name Marshall, I always think of that Paw Patrol show. You may not have any idea what that is, but I just can't get it out of my head that a dog would be scatter plotting. Anyway, generally speaking, I can look at this data and get a pretty decent feel for it. So let's say I did, and I actually feel like it's probably a little bit more over here. And this will probably shift over due to technology issues. So yeah, almost too much. Um, but it gives me the general idea. It's not, and it would work even better if I had struck a chord more appropriately. So let's do this and let's see if that does anything. I still feel like it's going to be way off. but There you go. Adventures and scatter plotting. So it's pretty close. So it's not like they're way far off. There's a general relationship here. I would say that as the time spent watching television increases, the time exercising seems to go down. Generally speaking, we would look at this as a negative relationship. And it's pretty close, too. So the number of the correlation coefficient, which tells us how close it is to a line, is going to be pretty good, I think. So we'll see what happens with Marshall's experiment. So Marshall computed a correlation coefficient of negative 0.98, which is what I've suggested that it might be pretty close. I mean, I've seen this question ahead of time, but even then, what does the coefficient mean in terms of the data he collected? So in order to do that, just go back and look at the axis labels and just see what, the, what it really says. More television, less exercise. More exercise, less television, generally speaking. Because it's negative, there's no correlation between the variables. That's not at all what it means. If there's no correlation between the variables, you wouldn't get something that's so close to 1. A negative 1 would be it's 100% they're competing against each other. You have 1 versus the other. Uh, no correlation would be something in the middle when we start to move 70 to negative, uh, or so 0.7 to negative 0.7. And really, like 50 50 means there's no correlation at all, it's just totally random. Uh, because it's negative, the correlation between the variables is weak. That's not true at all. Negative versus positive doesn't have anything to do with how strong or weak the connection is. It's negative because as one increases, the other decreases. That's that's what that means. It has the correlation coefficient is 0.98. That's 98%. That's really strong correlation. So p is out as well. Because the absolute value is close to 1, there's a strong correlation between the variables. That's pretty good. It's negative, so there, you know, as one goes up, the other goes down. But 98%, again, very strong. And because it's close to 1, there's a positive correlation. No. The absolute value gives us an analysis of strong versus weak. It doesn't give us an analysis of positive versus negative, because that would say if you watch more TV, you'd have more time to exercise. So it doesn't make any sense. R, if Wally -E taught us anything, right? So that's part A. Part B says a certain student watches television for an average of 38 minutes per night. So that's probably a level of importance that I should address. Television, 38 minutes. Based on Marshall's model equation, how many minutes will that student spend exercising? Now, the weak move here would to be go back. It would to be to go back and look at this and just kind of guesstimate. That's a dangerous move. I need to use the actual equation.
the equation builds the relationship between inputs and outputs. My x value would be time spent watching TV, so that's my input. If I substitute that into the equation, then I can get the corresponding amounts of output, which in this case would be time spent exercising. So I do negative 1.5 times 38 plus 121, and it gives me 64. So my answer let me see if I can scroll down here and match it up the box. No, I missed it. Uh, so my answer for B is 64. Not bad. Part C. What are the meanings of the slope and y-intercept for Marshall's model? Select the two that apply. So again, negative 1.5x plus 1 to 1. So as I was saying, this is an output value. If I set x to 0, so they're not going to spend a minute at all, nothing, watching television, this whole term becomes 0, so this is the only part that makes an, that's left. So what this tells me is if I eliminate the effects of the input, so I don't watch any TV, my output is 121 minutes of exercise. So this gives me what happens in the very beginning. That's my starting point. So if nothing else occurs, 121 exercise minutes will be there. Um, on the flip side of that, the slope takes me from 121. And I'm actually going to um, look at this as a fraction. Negative 1.5 is negative 3 over 2. What happens here is the slope represents change. It just tells me how much it changes for every input value that I add. So for every minute of television watching that I do, Marshall's model will suspect that you'll have negative 3 over 2. So if I was on a graph, I'd start here, and I'd go down 3 and over 2, which is why I wanted to show you this part, just to give you physical representation, or visual representation, kind of like that. Uh, but what it really means is for every one minute that gets added in here, I'm going to reduce 1.5 minutes of exercise time from the 121. So really, the more that the people watch TV, they actually don't even lose it at a one-to-one -one rate. They go down one and a half minutes of exercise for every minute of television that they watch. So there's not an equal trade-off, which is kind of interesting. So let's look at what all possible options are here, and we'll pick the best one for us. For every additional minute spent watching television, the number of minutes spent exercising decreases 1.5. That's pretty good. That seems like something I'd be interested in, because there's my input. If it goes down 6, I would do 6 times this plus this, and it would show you 6 times 1.5, which is 9. So it would go down 9 minutes. Um, on and on and on. For every additional minute spent exercising, the number spent watching TV decreases. See, this doesn't make any sense because it's backwards, so you have to be careful here. The number of minutes spent exercising. Exercising in this question is not an input. Our input, our independent variable, is TV watching. So we can't really say the relationship is set up this way. So you have to be careful about which one you pick. You want to make sure that the first part represents your input the x. For each additional minute spent exercising, number of minutes spent watching television increases. Again, it starts off incorrectly in form, and then it's like, well, you, you also watch more TV. I guess that might be true if you uh, use a treadmill or ride a bike while you're watching TV, but not here. If a student watches no television, the model predicts the student will exercise for 121 minutes. That's our zero input scenario. No TV at all. Lots of exercise. If the student exercises for more than 80 minutes, the model predicts that the student will not watch television. No, it doesn't. I mean, even physically speaking, it might. So let's see. I don't, I'm trying to guess where they get that. It says that if you watch TV for more than 80 minutes, so out here, the model predicts that the if the student exercises for more than 80 minutes. Sorry. Oh, they're trying to do a flip version of this. They're trying to get you to jump on the idea that it stops here for this to be uh, spent watching television 80. But even then, they're still doing something. So 
that's not what it says at all. So the answers to 28 are A and D. Question D, or Part D, I should say. What information from the survey and Marshall's model, which statement is most accurate? So I have to look and analyze all of them. So when it says most accurate, make sure you check all of them and don't just jump on the bandwagon of the first one that looks good. A student who does not watch television must exercise more than 100 minutes each day. E possibly, but not necessarily. The problem here is it says they must do that. Must is a very powerful word. The model predicts that they will exercise more than 100 minutes, but it doesn't say they have to. So that's probably out. So I'm going to put like, that's like almost an X, but not quite. A student who does not exercise much must watch television for more than 100 minutes. Again, must is there. Not bad. Not great. A student who watches more television is more likely to exercise. That's not true. It shows that if students watch more television, they're less likely to exercise. So this one's definitely out. A student who watches more television is less likely to exercise. So there you go. That makes a lot of sense. So my answer for number 28 is S. And finally, part E. What is Y uh, equals negative 1.5X plus 121 rewritten as a recursive formula, where N represents the number of minutes spent watching television, and A sub N represents the number of minutes spent exercising. So when you see N versus A sub N, N just means the number of the term. So if you're running a race, your first place, your second place, your third place, at the end of the race, actually, not during the race, but at the end, you look at the results of a race, the order that they come, they, the people fall in, that's their n value. It's the number that they fall in. A sub n would be the value connected to the term. So if you're, you run first place, does it in, you know, two hours or whatever, I have no idea what race that would be. Um, they, their a sub n value, so their a sub 1 may be 2 hours. If it's um, the second place person does it in 2 hours and 2 minutes, then maybe it's a sub 2 is 2 hours, 2 minutes, that sort of thing. So this represents a number of term, this represents its value. The term recursive is built on the idea of reoccurring, what's happening over and over and over again. And the nice thing is, in slope intercept form, we have the perfect model for that to work. y is equal to negative 1.5x plus 121. As I was saying earlier, this number represents what happens over and over and over again as we keep adding x. So another x, another times 1.5. Uh, another x, another, um, sorry, not times 1.5. Another x, you subtract 1.5. Another x, you subtract 1.5. So when I build a recursive formula, I want to identify a formula, or a number, so if I want to know what the third term is, so say a sub 3, in order to find the third term using a recursive formula, the only thing I can do or use is the number in front of it. So I need to know the second term first. So if I always say here's the second term, and then I'm going to subtract 1.5 every time. That's how I find it. If I don't know what the second term's value is, I don't know it's 7 or whatever it happens to be, I can't figure out the third term from a recursive formula. If I'm using an explicit formula, I can do that because explicit takes me directly from the input value of 3 or whatever to the output value that matches it. That's what explicit means. It doesn't necessarily mean, usually when you hear explicit it means there's bad words. The reason is because bad words are supposed to be no filter. You just say what you mean and that's it. You don't like calm it down for the audience. An explicit formula in math means that you go directly from the input or the n value to its actual value itself. So the n number goes directly to value. That's explicit. Recursive, I need to just say, okay, this is what's happening and over and over again. And if I have the term in front of it, I can tell you, which most of the time people tell you that, well, if you can give me this, I can give you this. Problem is most of the time you can't give them the first thing. So recursive isn't super useful, but it's just kind of a statement about what's happening. So when I change this up, you'll notice that I had n is 3 here. But to get there, I needed to know the second term. So whatever n's value is, same here, by the way. To find the a to the fifth, I need to know the a to the fourth. So instead of saying uh, some 
actual numbers, I'll use the generic, so the generic of n is n, of course. So to go one away from that, I just say n minus 1. And what's happening is represented here by the slope. I'm just doing it over and over and over again. That's what's recurring. The only other part... Actually, I should say that the other... the part that makes it work, the thing that makes it actually do what it's supposed to do, um, is the idea of where do I start out? Because if I say, yeah, you just subtract 1.5 every time, if I start at a million, subtracting 1.5 is a whole different story than I say, hey, start at zero. So I need to have a starting point. When I'm doing a traditional sequence where I have one, two, three, four, and then I have their values like this, that sort of thing. Um, when I'm looking at that kind of sequence, I use my the first the value of the first term. So I would say a sub one is. When I'm given a graph, I have a much better uh, starting point because it's explicitly given to me because we define it in the slope intercept form as the intercept. When we graph this, 121 would be right on that y axis, like way up here somewhere. So that gives me my starting point. So instead of saying a sub 1, I don't need to do that because it's not my true starting point here because I can have a zero term. It's kind of nice. Um, I say my a sub 0, subscript, it's just a, anytime you have little numbers down here, that's subscript, which is just a label. It doesn't have math value or operational value anyway. So it starts at 121. So the story of this recursive relationship is that I start at 121 and if I want any term from there starting at 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever, if I know the term in front of it I could just subtract 1.5. So starting at 121 I'd subtract 1.5 and then on and on and on to get me to the final answer. So that's your final set for part E and my answer would be right here. Even if you couldn't get to that point, you're like, uh, I have no clue. If you can just remember that this represents the part that changes, that's what the recurring part is. So look for the bigger picture, find the recurring part, and then you can, you're, you're good to go. Um, and, or you could remember that this is the starting point. This represents starting, this represents change. Change goes with this formula, the starting point goes with this point. So at least you can have some idea, if you're given multiple choice, how to get there, even if you get kind of lost in the middle or nervous on test day. All right, so if you noticed a glitch in the video, I totally forgot there's a part F to this as well. This thing never ends. Um, Marshall surveyed another set of 12 students and recorded the results in a table. Based on these results, what's the average rate at which exercise time is reduced for students who watch between 25 and 60 minutes of television? The key here that saves us a ton of time is average rate. I do not need to find the individual changes, I simply need to analyze the two points, the one at the beginning of the interval and the one at the end. So 25 and 64 and 60 minutes would be 60 and 33. Now I just need to apply the slope formula which is of course this. I'm old-fashioned, so I tend to mark these. That way I can know exactly where things go and I don't get lost. Do yourself a favor and write down just this part at least and then what matches up. That way you don't make a mistake. This is really easy to get correct. It's also really easy to get wrong. Since this is a calculator section, I'm going to be super lazy. And I want to convert that into a decimal. And I get negative 0.88. It doesn't actually tell me what to round to. So that's kind of a bummer. Let's round to the hundreds place. So in the hundreds, when I round, I look at the term I'm interested in, which is the 8. 
uh, and then I look to the one to the right of it, which is 5, 5 or more raised the score, so it's negative 0 0.89. And really, by not telling you what they want you to round to, you have a lot of options. I'm assuming, even though the key doesn't mention it, you could round it to 0.9, or you could round it to minus 1 if you want. They give a lot of options by leaving that part out. I think they just probably forgot to do that and then didn't feel like fixing it. So there you go, A, B, C, D, E, and F of question number 28.